Kathy, thank you so much for coming on and well tuning in from from Andorra. It's uh, it's real, really great to have you on. So thank you so much for coming on. No, it's great to be here. I am really interested to just delve into first out how you even got into the world of climbing. Like, where did that for you start? What was the passion and the inspiration behind getting involved and and starting that and on your quest now? I think the very first step was just exposure. So in my case, it was one of these sort of teenage summer camps. And for the first time, I got a chance to to camp and hike in in what for South African were big mountains, the Drakensberg. And I liked it because I I went I'd gone to the kind of school that tries to turn out uh, ladies. So we did all these rah rah team sports, which I hate. And um, I don't, you know, hit balls well, tennis and hockey and that kind of thing. And yeah, I, did, I was the sort of person who was always being picked last when you were picking for teams, which does not ever make you feel like you enjoy team sport. <laughs> so suddenly here with these outdoor activities, it's like, well, this is fun. It's physical, but it's it's not competitive. Um, it's very personal. And I really liked that. And I got to try rock climbing and I thought that was fun too. But at that point, there was nowhere for a 14-year-old girl to go who lived in the suburbs of Johannesburg. But it sat in the back of my mind. And when I got to university and found there was a rock climbing club, I joined that. I joined the outdoor club. The outdoor club drank much too heavily for me. So I, I stuck to rock climbing. And I loved it. That same sense of discovering a physical activity that I was good at, which was, you know, novel, and that wasn't competitive, it wasn't win-lose, it was utterly personal. And it happened in these wildly beautiful locations. And basically there, I was off. What is the motivation that sits behind climbing? I know, I imagine the sheer motivation to want to achieve something and something's a bit sitting in front of you and can I get to the top? But what But what was that motivation for you? What, what, what was it like for you? So at this point, I think I have to acknowledge different people are motivated by different things. You can be doing exactly the same activity and have very different reasons for taking part in it. And although I do things that seem terribly goal orientated. You know, clearly, you only climb things because you want to be on top of them. Like, yeah, no. <laughs> mm. Mostly in rock climbing, you don't even get to the top. You just do the interesting bit and then you you abseil off or, you know, scramble down the side or something. It's, it's the curiosity of – it's the curiosity and the challenge of puzzle solving. Mm. Looking at something and going like, okay, I've got this physical thing in the world, this – rock face, the snow and ice peak. I've got myself physically, what my body can do. Then uh, mentally, what I can hold together in terms of controlling fear and staying calm. And then sitting between those two, I've got my skill set of what I've been trained uh, to do. And I'm going to take these two things, put them together and see if there's a way through to the end, and whether that's the top of the rock face or the summit of the mountain, or frankly, simply traveling through your landscape and getting out the other side unscathed and coming home in one piece. All of that is kind of a real world gameplay. I don't know, I don't play video games, but I I suspect that maybe people who do are doing this, but I get to do it in the real three dimensional world. And in these incredible wild places, and that I love. Yeah, I I have done very minimal climbing. I've 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 literally just done a few days of bouldering, and I can tell even just by being in a climbing facility that there are people there that you can do this, you can do the routes, you can do the 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 different levels. But for me, there, there's so many people that are there to willing to help out and to figure out the puzzle and. It's that that's for me the when I got there, I I just assumed like just go do you know what? Just climb, get to the top. And that's the 
that's the goal. But actually, it's how can you do it efficiently? How can you do it and move your body and find that challenge within yourself? And and that's really, really nice to also then add that into nature, I guess, be able to bring that into nature and the, the natural world and connect with that. How do you train? Do you, do you train those different elements? You mentioned about like controlling fear and talking about that being an element. Do you train these different elements? What you were talking about, that amalgamation of all these different elements of climbing, do you train them individually? Do you do certain things to, yeah, to bring it all together at the end? Hmm. I think there are a couple of different strands that you're having to pull together. So the most obvious one that everybody jumps onto is physical training. Mm -hmm. Frankly, because... It's not so much that it's easiest, but it's sort of the simplest. You can kind of see what's going on and then you just go and execute your training plan. And yes, that matters. It's one of the reasons I was never an incredibly good rock climber because I'm not naturally all that strong. To get high grades in rock climbing, you know, by high I mean French 7A and up, mm -hmm. I rarely need to train. And I find the training boring. <laughs> so I was never... 7A was as good as I ever got, um, you know, lead climbing outdoors with rock climbing. So there's that. But then there's this thing that people frequently overlook, which is skills training. And I actually think this is the more interesting one because I don't do sports. Ooh, I'm probably about to sound condescending to people who run because there is proper form in running. Nevertheless, you can pick up a pair of running shoes, run down a road, and you're more or less doing it okay. Yeah, yeah. Whereas climbing, and I mean everything from bouldering through to ice climbing, there's a very big spectrum that you could get called climbing. There's a lot of actual skill that has to be taught, how you use crampons, how you use ice axes, mm. how you... Uh, navigate glaciers. And even in rock climbing, a lot of people bounce quickly up to a certain grade and then get stuck. And it's not because they aren't strong enough. It's because at this point, they need to learn technique about moving their body weight, about placing their feet, about extending their body to extend their reach. And there's actually technical skill. And mountaineering has got a whole lot more because you've got all these other tools and then you've got to understand the environment, both the weather and the landscape you're moving mm. in. And that needs to be trained. And the way to do that, frankly, is to join clubs and you know, do their training courses. So this weekend, I'm doing a two-day um, you know, advanced alpine training course. And it's, it's stuff I've done before, but it evolves. Safety standards change, new equipment gets introduced. I look back and think, well, I've been doing this for 30 years. So that, does that mean I'm doing things that are now, frankly, three decades out of date? So I, every couple of years, I retrain in the various aspects of skill and safety. So I think that's one that people often ignore. They think it's just going to be about, you know, lifting weights in the gym, and it's not. Yeah, you're right. You can, you can see that, can't you? You can see that. That's the bit that you can walk into any... Any, any rock climbing facility and you just think, oh, well, I do X amount of pull-ups and I'll, I'll be able to pull myself up sort of thing. But this is the stuff that is more, for me, definitely. And I get what you mean about the complexity of a skill. Like I play cricket and that that has, you have to learn those skills. You have to be able to understand it. You have to have the experiences. Mm -hmm. Experiences, I think there was something you were almost leaning into a little bit, which was, was you have to go out there and experience it in order to to learn from it, I guess. I think and that's the third part um, right. of the, the previous question about controlling fear. Mm. And, I mean, maybe you can make it work with visualization, but most people don't do visualization properly. They do daydreaming mm -hmm. and fancying themselves doing something heroic and difficult. But I think the kind of visualization that truly professional athletes do is much more tightly focused on trying to really recreate the situ situation and sensation. And most of the rest of us actually don't do that properly. For me, overcoming fear is about experience. 
experience and confidence. So confidence means having a good skill set and then believing in my ability to be creative in using my skill set to solve any one of a, a thousand different possible scenarios. Mm. And the skill set comes, as I said, from doing the training and revising the training because it's never one and done. And then the confidence comes from taking those skills into the field, getting into trouble, basically, and getting myself out of trouble again. Mm. And every time I do that on a small scale, on a bigger scale, the skills are just a little bit more deeply embedded. You know, my mental state is just a little bit more, yeah, 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 I've got this. I've been here before. I've done things like this before. I'll sort it out. Mm. So experience, just getting out there and doing it. You said that I've, the experience, I've done this before, but surely there's another part of it where not every experience is like the one previous where everyone every single one has this slight difference to it and you were dealing in the natural world in many very unpredictable so where does that i mean i'm surely adaptability's got to come into it there, there to be able to adapt to that 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 situation so have you ever faced a scenario where you've been okay this is completely new and i'm going to have to figure this new puzzle out uh, with whatever i have right now when I say I've done this before, I don't mean I have literally done this mountain, this route, mm -hmm. this very particular scenario before. I mean, I've been in a situation before. Mm -hmm. So one of the things you do need is the ability to transfer in a creative way. So it's more like I've been in a difficult position where I'm stressed and tired and half a dozen of the options I thought I had have just been shut down and I'm going to have to look for new things. And each time we've done that, it's like, well, that's another version of the problem which I've solved. And you go forward thinking, yeah, okay. So you've got to think of done it before in its broadest sense. And what you're leaning into is your own creativity and your own um, broad skill set. And that's what gets you through. And you've climbed, I mean, the, again, this is, I'm not sure whether you do it all the time, but is the majority of the time you climb with a team or on your own? Well, I don't, I do actually do a fairly wide range of sport, almost all of which, well, all of which are outdoors, mm -hmm. almost all of which are in mountains. All of them involve both risk and, and skill. Some can be done on your own. Some, ha some have to be done in a team. And I'm not necessarily pursuing the hardest possible physical challenge in, in each of them. I'm interested in wild places and things that are new to me. I don't know. It's okay if other people have done them already. Mm -hmm. And I'm just interested in continuing to explore so that's what I'm after. Generally, if it's going to be truly challenging, I'll want some, to have somebody else with me. Mm -hmm. I'm not a solo superstar. If it gets difficult, I want to be able to share that difficulty yeah. with somebody else. <laughs> Even if it's just looking at them and going, this is what I think. Am I missing anything? Am I still making sense? <laughs> you know, I'd like to be able to check in with someone else. And I like to be able to share it, even if, frankly, we're not doing a lot of talking. You've just got your head down to, to get through whatever it is. I still enjoy being in that space with someone else and being able to get to the end and look at each other and go, hell yeah, we made that one work. That's great. Yeah, that, that I think, I think um, for me, when I've looked at some of the expeditions that Climb has been on, and obviously we can get onto Everest, but that, for me, that, sense of what well, you were talking about the process of going through and 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 undoing the puzzle and and that creativity uh yeah that that sense of i've played team sports and there is that lovely feeling at the end where you can turn around and just be yeah we did that like that was an accomplishment not only an accomplishment by me but a common accomplishment for us and i think uh i think even in the most sort of solo of ways you can still have this sense of sense of team um 
I wanted to, I wanted to talk about it's leading from this idea of controlling fear, uh, and and how how have you ever come up against this, a moment that was almost an unimaginable amount of pressure for you, where you where you've kind of come out of it and gone, how did I, how did I get through that? How did I um, manage this moment? Has there ever been a moment for you where you've just gone, I, I'm really here just making decisions based on instinct and and kind of that sense of kicking, or has it always been super trained? I don't think I've ever felt truly panicky, out of control, just scrabbling around to do anything. I've... I think I've always felt or thought about it like this. So the sense you start out to do something. And if you imagine there are certain constraints around you, but they're pretty broad. You imagine you're in a room, big spacious room. There are walls out there, but they're not getting in the way of where you want to go. And then as things start to go wrong or get difficult in, in various ways, it's as if that space starts to shrink in on you. So the, the walls are closer and closer, so the darkness is coming in, but you've still got a line of light you're trying to follow. And I think there are definitely people who by, by temperament, I think almost um, without being able to switch it off, look into the darkness and start to catastrophize because there are always at least 100 nasty ways you can die when doing outdoor sport basically. Mm. So you can get sucked into that, all the ways it could go wrong, but that's actually terribly helpful. Other than having a quick look, it could go wrong like that, what am I going to do about it? Mm. And I've always been able to keep on looking towards the light, which is the way out. It's the solutions that still exist. And that can get very tight. <laughs> it has on a few occasions got very tight, like you're crawling through a tunnel. But there's still a way out. There's still a set of possibilities and I'm still working my way towards them. And I've never been in a situation where I felt like I'd completely run out of possibilities of things I can work towards to, to try and extricate myself or us as a group from this situation. Are there, are there techniques that you use away from your expeditions, your hikes to, to actually train your mind? Is there any, any techniques you use sort of at, at a, at sea level? <laughs> Not really. I, I don't think I'm necessarily a good fit for anybody who's into the modern self-improvement mm. um, uh, philosophy. I mean, like everybody, I've read a certain amount of that stuff about creating a better me through this, that, and the other and it all just sounds exhausting and not terribly interesting. So a few things I've ever tried, it's like, yeah, no, thanks. I'll just, I'll just keep on walking my way through life and see how it goes. Uh, and it's been fine so far. So, no, I don't sit at home trying to hone my mental capacity. I do think some of this is innate. I think I'm more pragmatic uh, than some people, and I certainly seem to have pretty low levels of anxiety. I don't get, I don't catastrophize. I don't get terribly anxious. I've got relatively high risk tolerance and I think relatively good self-confidence about trying to, to solve situations. And that seems to be, to me, to be innate. I, I really like that. I actually like the, uh, I, I kind of hope that there is a, even in the sports world, a little bit of a, a full 360 that well just a full circle that happens in the sense that people are, are like you said looking for this self development all the time but actually the real like what you've been doing is the real learning is in the doing and that for me is something that I think we tend to want to grab onto any not for a better word but like any rung that we can find to to forget that the actual human experience is the bit that teaches us the most and I I hope that we kind of circle back to to that a little bit more and away from how can I do it and 
and I'm a really big believer in there are many sort of ancient methods that have been around for for a long, long time. And in the actual sense of them, they're very, very simple. And those simple ones end up being the best ones. You haven't got to overcomplicate something too much. And and if there's anything the podcast has taught me from speaking to many different athletes from many different backgrounds is that they just tend to do these things that are super simple because they're so much easier to understand. And then when you need them the most, you don't have to overcomplicate that process and you can just do. And and that I think is is something that I hope people can definitely take home with them for sure. I'd I'd like to uh, to shift on to obviously Everest. Now this is the thing that I'm sure you are continuously talking about and and are asked to sp- to speak about. And I'm really interested in your first climb on the south side. So in it, your first ever attempt going up, what was the lead up to that? Like where did the goal? When did that? whole process was it a long drawn out process to building yourself up to it many attempts or was it uh how how long did was that in the making well this is where the story ends up being exactly the opposite of what anyone's going to expect so i went to everest at the age of 27 and it was the first south african everest expedition now i've been rock climbing since I was 18 and mountaineering since I was 21. And at that point, I'd climbed in the Alps and the Andes and Central Africa, but I'd never been over 6,000 meters. Now, at no point in any of this had I ever wanted to climb Everest. I just liked climbing. I, I never had a tick list of mountains to be conquered. I just liked going climbing. And at a time when there were no commercial expeditions and no guides, there were far, far fewer opportunities to go climbing. It was also much harder to travel back then. And of course, South Africa was under sanctions, which made it even harder to travel. So all I did was look for opportunities that would take me places. And I hadn't even thought about the Himalaya until I picked up a book, very good book. It's by Arlene Bloom called A Woman's Place, and it's the first all-woman expedition to an 8,000-meter peak to Annapurna. She was the leader. And having read the book, I thought, whoa, the Himalaya. Okay, maybe that would actually be possible. And that was, that was what it was, the Himalaya, anywhere in the Himalaya, any expedition. But it's almost impossible. You, know, you had to be invited to join people who obviously didn't want to take people they didn't know and didn't want to take people with less experience. So it was really hard uh, to get going with this kind of thing. And then splashed across the newspaper was the first South African Everest expedition, all male team. It's like, well, you know, it's a pretty male sport. That doesn't seem that surprising. And then at the bottom was this story The newspaper was one of the sponsors and they were running a competition to find a girl to join the team. And I mean, even in the way it was presented, it was pretty clear that this was a publicity stunt. Mm. It was the newspaper trying to find ways to make this project they'd sponsored more interesting to the readers. So, you know, 26, doing my master's at university, um, looking at this, thinking, oh, God, this is sexist, yeah, really. The men have been invited based on their CVs, and the women are going to have to compete uh, to try and get one place on the team. But the bottom line was they were going to have a short list of six who would do a sort of selection expedition uh, to Kilimanjaro, highest mountain in Africa, and then one would be invited to join the team. And I was pretty sure I could make the shortlist. There weren't that many women with actual climbing experience. So it's like free trip to Kilimanjaro. How bad can it be? <laughs> so, yeah. The one thing I did do as soon as I applied, which was in November, I started to train as if I was going to Everest, just in case. Right. Made the shortlist, went to Kilimanjaro, male film crew, male journalist, male team leader, this is early reality television, basically, but but with a real prize. We're not trying to be TV presenters. We're trying to get, you know, this, this chance to go to the Himalaya. And uh, I got the, the slot on the Everest team. But 
I still wasn't going to climb Everest. I was going to climb on Everest. It's not the same. Mm -hmm. Because back then, the only way you learned to climb was as an apprentice. There weren't commercial training courses. You went with people who were better than you. You learned as much as you could. You went as far as you could, and then you stopped. They would finish the mountain, pick you up on the way down, and down you'd go. And that was completely standard. So in going to the Himalaya, the idea that I was on an expedition without expecting to reach the summit, completely normal. I was like, cool. Let's see how far I can go. Let's see how high I can get. You know, I've never really been on a mountain where I just was ground to a halt and said, my God, I can't go no further. And this is the chance. So it wasn't until literally the summit day on what had turned out to be a very long expedition when I was finally on the summit ridge and could see in the distance, I could see the peak, I could see the very last bit of the climb. And I thought, oh, right, I can do that. That's fine. That's when I thought, I, oh, right, now I'm going to climb Everest. Wow. That, so, I mean, what a wild circumstance that is. That's not, uh, mm -hmm. you're right, that's not the story that I think people would have been expecting. So, do, I mean, what is it like? I've never spoken to anyone who has actually stood on the top of, of Everest, so I would be remiss to not ask what it is like being there. Well, uh, the best bit isn't actually the top. Right. Because the key point about mountain climbing, it's not like running a road race. You can't literally collapse on the side of the road and call a taxi. If you turn round, you've still got to have the physical energy to do days of climbing to get you back down the mountain. There's no shortcut. So at all times, you cannot completely use up your reserves. You're mm. always having to keep something in, in case. And you know the tighter those reserves are, the more difficult the descent is going to be. So most cases, when climbers get to the top, they're instantly starting to focus about the descent. Mm. There are more accidents on the way down, not because it's genuinely more difficult, but because people are almost always very tired and they've stopped concentrating. They were very focused going up to the summit. Now their minds have gone home and their bodies left to make its way down the mountain without much focus. Mm -hmm. you know? So at least for me, when I get to the top, I'm already thinking like, okay, it's not over. Stay focused. Don't stay here for too long. You know, this is not the time to start making mistakes. So the best bit is kind of when you see the summit in the distance. On Everest, there's a thing called the South Summit. And then there's the famous Knife Edge Ridge where the Hillary Step used to be before the earthquake. And then the summit. And you don't get to see the ridge until the summit day. It's hidden from lower down. And climbing that ridge was the best bit. That sense of the summit is there, I'm going to get there, still focused on going up. And you've already got the huge views because you're on this knife edge between Nepal and, and Tibet. And, and then you finally come up onto the final bound of snow. The last view opens up on the other side. You're the highest thing in the world. You can see hundreds of miles across the plains of Tibet to cross into India. That sense of height and space and just yeah. that you're literally looking down on everything in the world. Uh, that is extraordinary. Yeah. Wow. That. What is it? What is it? I mean, as well, you you kind of touched on it earlier that it was a lot less congested going up there so there's a lot less people going up on some i mean the expedition numbers now are insane i think having watched uh nims Perger's 14 peaks like just those images that were taken on that series like the it almost it really as weird as it sounds it it put me off it it put me off going onto the mountain and just being like this whole what you've just described there that space and that 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 openness just doesn't seem to be there now. I don't know. What do you? How do you feel about it? Mm. All right. So let's just say two things about that. So I've climbed Everest twice. Both times we were the only team above the top camp 
on the summer day. So I've never had the queue. Right. Okay. I was, but I, I did climb Everest now 25 years ago. <laughs> so I had sort of the much closer to the genuine climbing experience. I'm not a big fan of the queues, although there are a few upsides. Um, but what interests me is the very human side of this. Those queues are basically on one route in one season. There are three climbing seasons, spring, autumn, and winter. There are hmm, about 15 different climbing routes on Everest. Mm -hmm. You could take one of the other 14. <laughs> there are at least two routes that have never been climbed, still waiting for a first ascent. Try one of those. But people are weird. They want this thing because they think it's terribly difficult and it will be impressive when they've done it. But on the other hand, they want it the easiest way possible. You know, we, we create the rules of the game and then we try and make the game as easy as we can. So you don't have to be in the queue. You can go there in autumn, even on the standard route. You'll be the only person trying to do it. You could climb one of the other routes. You'll be on your own. You could go to the east face. And given that the east face is... Uh, I've actually been on the East Face and tried, well, gone to look at these unclimbed routes and went, my God, no, and turned around and went home again. Oh. But I can tell you it's whatever, three or four days drive, cross a pass, six days of trekking, which you will see no one. And then you will be alone on the East Face of Everest. If you want the genuine climbing of Everest, it's there, but it's difficult. Yeah. The people in the queue don't want to put in the decades of work to become the world-class climbers who could do Everest the old-fashioned mm. way. Mm. Yeah. So when you ended up doing the North the North route, when you did your – in 1999, so that's three years later, I believe, doing that. So when you went to do that, that that's a harder route, is it? Is it or have I misread that? <sighs> yes. I think largely it's a very different route, which is part of the reason we went. After the first successful attempt, it's like, okay, that's done. Uh, and also these, it, it was um, a fairly complicated expedition, the first one. So it's like, that's done, the Everest's done, never again, move on. But myself and the leader of the first team thought, okay, we've now got a lot of um, publicity uh, we could use this to try and raise money to go and do some other big mountains. And we wanted to try K2, second in the world. We felt we didn't have the experience. Uh, the standard route in K2 is pretty difficult. So we're trying to raise money for one of the other, say, top five or six in the world. Nothing. We could not raise money in South Africa. But what we found was that sponsors were saying, Oh, but if you went back to Everest, why? We've done Everest. What's the point? But companies, they saw Everest, they saw a bunch of media coverage, and they think, yeah, okay, let's do that again. Mm. It's like, mm, but whatever. If you're going to do these weird things, you've got to take what you're passionate at and what the market will pay for. This is if you need other people's money. And you're trying to look for where the overlap is. Mm. And we realized if we went to the other side of Everest, different country, different climate, different geology, the two routes literally meet on the summit. You don't even get the same views until you are standing right on top. So the sponsors get Everest and we get what is effectively a new mountain, a whole new set of experience. Uh, so that's why we went to the north side of Everest. But coming back to difficulty, I think the bottom line is the most difficult part on the south is at the bottom, and it's the ice fall. Right. And these days, the ice fall is set by a professional team of Sherpas. So the individual teams aren't actually having to worry about the ice fall themselves anymore. It's, it's already been done. Mm. 
Whereas on the north side, the most difficult climbing is the summit day. So it's not that it's probably much more difficult, but it's happening above 8,000 meters instead of down here at sort of 6,000 meters. Mm. And it can't be solved with ropes and ladders as easily. It's these very steep slope of sort of ball bearing like shattered rock in between snow and ice and these narrow ledges of rock. And you've got to climb your way up, along, up, along, up, along. And all of the time, it feels like you're climbing on ball bearings. And you've got the 3,000 meters of the North Face under your feet. Mm. And of course, you're very low on oxygen and you're cold and you're tired and so on and so on. I think that's why the North Side's considered more difficult. And of course, if something goes wrong, it's much, much harder to get somebody down from up there. Yeah, I, I read your... I read your Guardian story that you wrote about the the nineteen ninety eight climb and and the I, I forget was it it was Fran uh, I forget the surname as well unfortunately the lady that you came across and, and I don't know if you are comfortable talking about that story and and that it's a it's a really incredible story for that and and obviously something that's very that's the human part of these. Of, and the reality that you're facing with with these climbs is that there are people that are lost. There are many people that are lost to the climbs, and and I think I don't know if this stat is still right that seventy twenty five percent of climbers make it. They attempt to climb, and that only twenty five percent make it. Is that that might be different now? Um, but yeah, just going back to that story, that um, I, I mean, that is really the tough part of of what you're doing. How do you deal with with those decisions, and especially on that day? I think you called it the choice. Is that right? Well, so let's um, give a big context, and then I'll explain uh, the story of Fran. So the context is that we're doing sports where people get killed. Mm. And yes, I think... I think for high altitude mountaineering, although commercial climbing is shifting this a bit, but before commercial climbing, I think high altitude mountaineering got you about a 1% chance of being killed on a mountain. Uh, Commercial climbing has actually made it safer. More people die, but that's because many more people are climbing. Right. If you bring it back down to a percentage, clearly killing the clients is bad for business. So on the whole, commercial climbing is safer than sort of traditional independent mountain climbing, which, of course, still goes on. So, yes, we are taking a real level of risk. That being said, you don't have to be on Everest for this. So no one should ever be on Everest and be surprised that people might get killed. That's just wildly irresponsible. You need to have got your head around that fact years earlier on other mountains in the world and decided how you feel about that, what are you going to do about that, what level of risk are you prepared to take. So the the story of Fran, Frances Osentiev, she was American. She was on her second marriage to a Russian guy, and it was the two of them. He had climbed Everest before and she hadn't. I think I'm right about that. And she was trying to be the first American woman to climb Everest without supplementary oxygen. So the team was just the two of them. No teammates, no Sherpas, no backup, which, you know, if you get it right, makes you a world-class climber. That is how the best climbers in the world climb. Of course, if if you get it wrong, it means you have very, very little help available to you. And the two of them had gone up to the high camp. The high camp is 8,300 meters. It's really high. They're not using oxygen, so they're up there without oxygen. They spent uh, two nights up there without oxygen, waiting for the weather to improve. They then climbed to the summit. They were seen by telescope from the base camp. So it's known that they got to the summit. Uh, They got to the summit late in the day. 
So it looks like they took a long time to climb. Climbing without oxygen will do that. It makes you, you get colder, you're physically slower, and you're not thinking as clearly. And again, the best climbers in the world can do it. And most of us can't. Mm. So they got to the top, and as far as we understand, on the way down, she collapsed. He left her to try and get help, and he vanished. So his body was found about three years later, and given where he was found, he fell at some point. Um, but that's why he, no, he wasn't known where he was. He, he fell off the climbing route and wasn't found until years later. So that's the setup. Um, now, my team, we're at the top camp. We're the only team at the top camp. We leave. We're supposed to leave at midnight, but we're slow. We leave at about 2 a.m. Very standard, to, well, pretty standard to climb in the dark at the beginning. Climb up the north face onto the ridge. And for those who know the Everest, the ridge has the three steps. The second one is the famous one, but there's actually step one, two, and three. And at the bottom of the first step, just at first light, um, I see a body. It happens. I, I've seen two others on Everest, and they don't rot because it's so cold. They just look like they're sleeping. And mm. the way I think of it is empty suitcases. Mm. You know, the person's gone, however that works. What, what you've got lying on the mountain is the empty suitcase. But this one twitched, and they don't normally twitch. So I went over to look, and I found her. I wasn't sure it was France. Uh, it was Frances. I'd met her once on the mountain. You know, the teams are fairly separate. It's not as if you're throwing big parties together every night. People do their own thing, and you cross paths briefly and talk to each other or share a cup of tea and, and keep moving. You know, the, the ethic is teams are self-sufficient. They need to be. You know, food, medical supplies, safety procedures, you know, it's meant to work within your team. You don't go there assuming that you can just bum off strangers. So um, I'd met her, but I didn't recognize her. That being said, there weren't very many women on the mountain. Um, she was bent over backwards. If you, if you imagine a rag doll that is bent at the waist backwards, he, he, he clearly tied her in before he left her. And she'd fallen backwards. It's a weird position. She pulled off her jacket and her gloves. Um, she was incredibly frostbitten on her face and her hands, waxy white. And she couldn't even sit up straight. Um, she could talk, but not really. You know, initially, when she said something, or she had to back off, well, this is happening all the time your mind is processing. What is this? How bad is it? What can we do? And all the time that's running through your head. So the first time I saw her, I was like, this woman, if she's still alive, she's going to die quickly. Mm -hmm. the, you know, it's very unlikely we can rescue somebody at this place in this position. Then she spoke to me and I'm like, oh, okay, hang on. Maybe it's, this is better than it looks. Because if she's vaguely coherent and maybe she can stand on her feet, so we can get our arms under her shoulders. Now, maybe you can start trying to shuffle her down. Remember, I talked about that incredibly steep, mm. shattered rock and ice slope with all the rock steps on it? Yeah. Mm. Got to try and get her down that. And then I realized that she couldn't actually. It was a broken record. She said three things, and she would just sort of randomly say them. She didn't respond. Her eyeballs were blown. She couldn't focus on me. She couldn't reply to me. She wasn't actually thinking in any coherent sense at all. And she had absolutely no muscle strength. She couldn't even sit up. So she's not going to be standing. The only way you're going to get a woman like that off the mountain is on a stretcher. 
Mm. There are no stretches. There's no medical help. There's no rescue. There's no one to call. And this is where it gets difficult because people at home go like, oh, there must be a solution. What they mean is they'd phone the police or they'd phone the ambulance, they'd hand it over to professionals, and if the person dies in the back of the ambulance on the way to hospital, oh, well. But, you know, you weren't there watching them die. And then they extrapolate that to the mountains and go, like, well, why didn't you do something? What? Mm. We've got a little bit of oxygen. We're using it. We use it at three liters a minute. If you give oxygen to a, a casualty, you know, they run it at whatever it is, seven liters a minute. You'll run through the bottle in half an hour. There aren't any more bottles. It's not a hospital. So we have no spare masks. So who goes off oxygen? in the hope that by you know, giving her half an hour of oxygen, which then runs out, and now we've got no more oxygen and she's still got no oxygen. That hasn't actually solved anything. Oxygen doesn't make you spring back to life. Um, we couldn't get her to drink anything. Um, just She couldn't sit up. She couldn't talk. We have There are no stretchers to carry her with. Um, and you've got this slope like this. Um, and our conclusion was that she was going to die within a couple of hours and that there was nowhere we could get her in a couple of hours that would make any difference whatsoever. And this is where people get very, very uncomfortable. Um, but that was our conclusion and high altitude medics I've talked to agree. Sometimes you're just too late. People die. The question then is, what do you do about it? We can't save her life. So we stay with her. We keep on climbing the mountain and go to the summit. We go down. That becomes the choice. And we're in the shade. It's freezing cold. The wind is howling. And I've never been so cold. I had this weird, weird sensation of like the organs in my chest cavity. I could feel them in a weird way. And they were just gray. Mm -hmm. And I was basically losing my core body heat. And as far as I was concerned, if I sat down with her and waited for her to pass, I wasn't going to stand up. So at that point, do we go down? Do we go up? Because we're not staying where we are. Remember, there's no outside source of heat whatsoever. Your own body movement is your only source of heat. I decided to go down. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't refocus on the climbing. Even though it made no difference to her what we did, I couldn't refine my, my passion for climbing in that moment. I just wanted to get off the mountain. And in the end, three of us went down, and two of the team who were Sherpas uh, went on to the summit uh, and then came back down. And yeah, wow. that was the story of, of Francis. Wow. And uh, blew up in a huge media storm afterwards, as these yeah. things do. I mean, yeah, and the way you tell it as well, it's um, it, even from just the way you wrote it and, and now hearing you say it again, it, it's really, it is gripping and it is. It is this sad reality. When you, when you came back down, did you, you said you lost that, was it, you lost that hunger to climb? Was it in that moment? Did it take a little bit of time to come back? What was the following days after that? For your sense of why you were going up on the mountain and going out climbing again? It didn't cause a crisis about the bigger picture of climbing. Um, I'd already had the crisis. Years earlier, I so my first and second expeditions. This is going back first to the Ruinsori and second to Bolivia. I had done um, with a South African British climber called Stephen Kelsey, and then I actually moved to Europe. We dated for a while, 
And I climbed on and off with him for about a year in Europe before I decided to move back to South Africa and he was going to stay in Britain and we, and we split up. And in that time, we'd also climbed quite frequently and we'd actually shared a flat for a while with a friend of his called um, Graham. And about, I don't know, six, six months maybe after um, we split up and I went back to South Africa, uh, he and Graham were climbing in Peru and they both died. And their bodies were found by Graham's girlfriend, Caroline, who I also knew. It was just utterly, utterly horrible for her. Mm. And that was the crisis when I kind of stopped climbing and really thought about, is this worth it? And he wasn't the only young man I knew who died. The early 20s are a pretty risky time for young men in general, and certainly for the extreme sport young men, when they're at the peak of their physical ability, but they haven't yet really absorbed the fact mm. that you can get killed doing these sports. So he wasn't the first one, but he was by far the closest. And Stephen was the, the kind of year and a half of I'll never do this again. Why did he do it? Why do we do it? What's, what do we get out of it? What don't we get out of it? Um, and, yeah, I think I eventually settled on the at least he died doing what he loved thing. Mm. But I have to say, 30 years later, when I look at all the decades of life, that people like Stephen Kelsey and, you know, and Phil Lloyd and some of the others I've known who died haven't got to live. I'm slightly less convinced about they, that they died doing what they loved thing. They did miss out on a hell of a lot. Um, anyway, that was a detour to say that there was less of a crisis about Fran, because I'd kind of done done it yeah. before, and we yeah. my own answer about why why I chose to climb. Yeah. Um, and although, as I said, I'd met her and she seemed like a nice woman, um, it didn't have the same impact as, as having a close friend die in the mountains, because uh, you just don't have the same intense sense of who they are as a person and what the rest of their life was about. Yeah. Wow. It's. Uh... It's intense. This is intense. Like it is, uh, it is, and you don't. I guess you're not putting any. Pun you're pulling your punches here with this. It's it's really, really, really. That's tough stuff. I mean, that's the pinnacle of of what is a challenge there. Through all of this, I I would really like to ask you what you believe are some of the important values that for yourself. Like, what are the sort of values that you felt have allowed you to do what you do? to to be who you are and the sort of things that you hold important for yourself in the person that you are? It's mm, an interesting question. Hmm. And see, I think I'm not necessarily saying it's in this particular order of priority, but mm. being valuing being independent and self sufficient. So, a lot of these activities, as I said, we go out in a small team and we can't just expect to be saved by strangers. We hope they'll help as we hope we'll help them, but we also know that there are limits to how far we can help other people for all sorts of reasons. And it's not about selfishness. It's just about limited resources and, in the end, things that are impossible to solve. So, um, and that applies even within teams. You know, mountain climbing, you don't have to get everyone to the top, but what you are trying to do is get everyone home. Mm. And as I said, you've got to give up while you can still walk your way back down the mountain. Anyone who can't walk anymore is now a real liability for the rest of the team. So there's a level of responsibility to your team to turn around while you still can or not to go on if you know that you're physically or mentally in trouble already. So you need a kind of honesty with yourself uh, because you can't afford, you don't want to get yourself into trouble and you really don't want to get your teammates into trouble. 
and now they're forced to try and save you because you've made, um, you know, unwise choices. Bad luck happens and everyone will step up and try and solve bad luck. But you can reduce, you know, problems by being, by being responsible. So I've always put quite a lot of value on that. I think I've, okay, coming out of that, put quite a lot of value on being responsible, self-responsible. So that means being honest. It means stepping back when necessary. It means stepping up when necessary. You know, take one for the team. There's always stuff that has to be done that nobody particularly enjoys. It doesn't help if everybody's trying to avoid it. You know, step up, contribute, do what needs to be done. Sometimes for the team to work, you're going to have to let go of some personal ambitions or some personal preferences. That's part of the collaboration of working in a group. Uh, equally, if you're going to turn up for the challenge, turn up well-trained, well-prepared, with the right equipment, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's not enough to turn up with a great spirit of optimism. You actually do need to turn up with some practical <laughs> preparation, that kind of thing. So uh, responsibility. And then those are all quite dry. I don't know, a certain level of, of joy in the experience. Because quite often we don't get what we want. The weather turns bad. Somebody gets injured. Piece of equipment breaks. Yeah, there are a whole lot of reasons why you might not get what you initially hoped for. And what you do get is the experience. And if things go wrong and you solve it in a, in a sensible, efficient way, you get that confidence. You get that experience. That's valuable. Mm-hmm. It can be a really good feeling to getting home, having got yourself out of the shit and think, yes. We saw it, we called it, we solved it, we extricated ourselves. We didn't see the summit, but who cares? That's one to be proud of. And I like, I like people who share that approach to it. In the end, let's have fun, let's learn, let's come home, and let's not end up in a huge sulk because we didn't manage to reach the summit. Yeah, I love that. I uh, Look. Kathy, I'm really conscious of time, and and these these have been this has been incredible. And I I wanted to just finish off with there's so many people that and and I'm sure when you've you've come down from any trek any climb, um, there's been the maybe what's the next thing? And I think we live in a world now where everyone is trying to. I feel like someone will try and climb Everest in a unicycle or something like that in some stage, and be the, I'm the first person to do that, and. Yeah. And and there's a, there's people doing runs and triathlons and ultras and all sorts that are these 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 feats of endurance or these these high challenges that people do. But when there comes a time where everything has kind of been done, where do we go from there? What 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 do we get out of what do we get out out of the the experience, the experience? Or I don't know what what would be your your take on this side of things. Well, so many of the current firsts are uh, deeply contrived. So I think if you want to climb Everest, people should go ahead. But to try and create the first, it's like it happened. It was, what, 70 years ago. Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgate did it. I'm sorry you were born too late, but mm. let it go, <laughs> you know. And so a lot of it has got to do with trying to raise money to pay for these things. And the media does participate in this and giving publicity to something that looks like a first. And I've played that game to some extent. So, you know, I'm not necessarily pointing fingers at other people. And I've built a very nice career of being the first woman in the world to climb Everest from both sides, even though it's frankly fairly meaningless as a record but it certainly helped with my corporate speaking career and that's funded all my other expeditions. So I do understand the the push to try and get attention and and raise money. But the bottom line is if, if you really want to be the first, then you need to be good, like the best in the world. Mm. And the current best are training like Olympic athletes 
and they have the talent of Olympic athletes, and that's what it takes. Interestingly, the very best climbers at that level, on the whole, don't get massive media attention. You get a few exceptions, like maybe Alex Honnold or, you know, Tommy Cadwell and Dawn Wall um, kind of things. But there are a lot of others who no one has ever heard of who's outside the community uh, and are making far less money out of what they do. Um, but, yes, so if you want to be the first, this, that, or the other, focus on being a world class. Most of us aren't good enough mentally or physically. And at that point, I think people should let it go. And... Do it for themselves. Do it because they yeah. want to. Yeah. Um, you know, and some of this first stuff is not just contrived, it's terribly first world, rich world centric. Every time somebody cycles across Africa, I'm like, oh God, have you ever been to Africa? Have you ever just seen the local people on their one gear, tatty bicycle, cycling incredibly long distances? You know. Uh, some, some, of, some of the endurance challenges are tone deaf um, as well as being contrived. So I think let it go. It doesn't matter if you're the first or not. You can still trek across Armenia or cycle across Africa or, you know, go and paddle down some river in some jungle. Go ahead. Mm. Do it because you want to. Do it because you find joy and inspiration in the process. You don't need to try and justify it with a record. I think you I think you answered what was going to be my next question, which was what would be your advice to someone who is going for something, going for an endure uh, a a feat of accomplishment and and maybe doesn't get there or is just yeah, giving it a go. And I feel like just enjoying the experience is the the best advice you can give there. Um I, I'm I'm also interested as a last leaving question would be you, I'm sure you have inspired many people through what you've done, but who has inspired you? Who are people who have been of inspiration for you? Oh, this is another one of these desperately awkward questions. Because uh, no. I know most people think like this, but I've never really felt like that. I mean, I've read books by people and thought, oh, that's cool. And, you know, I could definitely point to Arlene Bloom's book as uh, a doorway at the beginning of my climbing career. But I'm much more likely to read the books and go like, oh, that's an interesting place. I wonder if, if there's something there that I could do than to look at the person who was doing it and go like, oh, I want to be like her. So I don't know. I focus on the places more than the people. Yeah, is it? Isn't I actually had that the same question asked to me recently, and I I struggled with it as well. I'm like, who were the inspirations growing up for me? And and actually, for me, it was always the person that I I hope to become. That's the one. The person that I hope to become is the one that I get inspired by. But yeah, places. That's a def That's a different one as well. Look, Kathy, thank you so much for your time. It is um, it has been incredible like i mean these stories are just insane and your outlook and the strength and resilience that it, it that is there is it's just palpable and i really appreciate your time i'm grateful for it for people who are willing to find out more about you to to get in touch where's the best place to to send them to point them in the direction of right for day-to-day -day adventure it would be instagram which is at kathy o'dowd i also run a pretty open facebook uh, mostly just uh, adventures. There's a website, but it's very much focused on my corporate speaking work, kathyodal.com. And you didn't ask the, the question, but I will answer it anyway. Uh, the one about what comes next, just because it's fun. Oh, yes. Which is that, thank God, COVID is finally backing off, at least for us here in Europe. And... I leave for Kyrgyzstan in the middle of March with two friends, and we're doing an exploratory uh, ski mountaineering trip. So not that we're doing things that have never been done before, but that we've identified a couple of valleys where there's almost no information about any kind of skiing, but it looks possible to us. And we're simply going to hike in on skis, pulling our, our gear on sledges, set up a base camp with a tent, and go climbing mountains and skiing off them and see what we can find.
How long is that for? That sounds incredible. That's a three-week trip. Wow. So just no real info going in, just going in and exploring. That's uh, highly jealous of doing something like that. Um, yeah. But uh, look, Kathy, thank you so much. I'll, I'll point everyone in the direction with links in the show notes for, for those links. And um, thank you again for your time and for tuning in from, from all the way in Andorra. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Been a pleasure. Great to talk to you.